Jonas, welcome. So, uh, we will start immediately. And if you have any questions in between, just raise your hand. A microphone will come your way. But let me start with the first question. So, how did you end up making a film like this? You know, <laughs> with cars and so on. And um, perhaps, what were some of the inspirations, you know, other car-related movies? You know, you probably watched some in preparation for doing this, so... I, I did. Um, uh, I found this script during COVID. Um, I was stuck at home and I wasn't allowed to go outside. And then I found a script, an American script called Interior Car, uh, from a, a cult filmmaker himself called Trent Haga who's a, um, a director, but also a writer. We've been in touch since I saw his film Dead Girl many years ago, a very strange zombie movie. And uh, I was going crazy, as we probably all were in my house. I was like, do you have a small project that I could film in my home city because I want to go outside and I want to move around and I want to have an excuse to do so? And he sent me the script, which was basically two guys in LA in a car. And the first line of the script before the story started was, it said, uh, note, the camera doesn't leave the body of the car for the entire movie. And to me, that was enough. Uh, I, I didn't, the story didn't really matter. I thought, oh, that's such a cool Hitchcockian conceit. Uh, I'd love to try and do something like that. So that's how I found the script. Um, and then I watched every car movie because it's such, I was just afraid of making something boring because any one location trailer, uh, after an hour, you've seen every angle or uh, that's what I thought. So I looked at every possible car movie and I found some very interesting things. Uh, obviously, um, Steven Spielberg's first movie, a Duel, is, is just on YouTube, an incredible movie, all set, not all set in one car, but it feels like it, for example. There's a movie on Netflix that I don't think many people saw called Wheelman from a few years ago. Same conceit, it's, it's much more serious. Um, and then non-car movies, like uh, my favorite Scorsese movie is After Hours. Uh, it's just a guy trying to get home. Uh, after trying to get late, basically, and he just gets into a lot of trouble trying to get home, and I kind of wanted to get that frantic feel. So those were a few of the movies I watched in preparation for this. Um, so you said that you know you did, you took on this um, premise that you know it's shot entirely from inside the car, um, and as you said, you know it can get quite uh, yeah. You have to be very inventive in the ways you shoot the scenes. So perhaps you could talk a bit about this decision and did you regret it at one point of making the film? Uh, yes, the regret was immediate. Uh, uh, no, I, 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 I thought I was a prepared filmmaker beforehand, but this film needed to be storyboarded 100%. Uh, which I did, and which I'm very grateful. There was no room for technical improvisation because in the end we needed four different cars who could do different things, for example. So we wouldn't have known that if we hadn't prepared properly. But the day I, I, I really hated myself was when um, it won't mean anything to uh, an audience that's not from Belgium, but they go into a tunnel. Um, and that's basically, uh, it's just for pedestrians. And it's known in movies in Belgium because it's like the rom-com um, location where you go to film your love scene or your breakup scene. No cars allowed in there. But it, it's made to, to drive an ambulance. It was once made to drive an ambulance from one side of the river to the other. So I thought right, it could potentially fit a car. It's just wide enough. But also, uh, Belgian tradition, the elevator is always broken. Always broken. So uh, every day, as the shoot got closer, they said to us, it will be fixed on the day of, of shooting. It never was. On the day of shooting, it was fixed. We got in there, I had like two half days to shoot it. We got out and then the elevator was broken again. <laughs> I think we broke it again. And that was the day that I thought, why, why did I do this to myself, for example? But we, we, we did get the footage, so that was good. Um, and probably you had a stunt driver for the, you know, the fast scenes yes. and so on. So, so how was that, for example, you know? With it was a, a German guy called Lutz and he came from the James Bond movies. He was very calm and collected. One of the four cars we had was basically our car, but um, the whole steering mechanism was on top of the car. And because we don't leave the car, you never see Lutz sitting on the roof doing all the dangerous stuff. But especially because the lead actor is not actually uh, um, a trained actor. This is his first lead part. So I wanted him to not be killing people while trying to get a take. Uh, so his, his steering wheel moves, 
because it's connected to Lutz's wheel, but basically Lutz is in control of the car. That was that was uh, the biggest investment of the car, uh, of, of the shoot, but it, the most worthwhile one, I think. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the lead actor, who's it's his first lead role, as you said, uh, and he's also a known musician, a DJ. So perhaps you can talk a bit about this decision to cast him, and also how you build this character of you know Noah, because you know he's it. Despite this being an action film and, you know, with all this crazy stuff going on, it's still, you know, you still have a really, you know, very complex character. I mean, in a sense, but, you know, it's, it's there. The character is sure. there. It's very specific, you know. So, uh, Dimitri Vegas is, is playing Noah. He's uh, one half of a DJ duo. Uh, they're called Dimitri Vegas and Like Mike. Um, and in Belgium, it's kind of a... There's a controversy around them because people don't like them to succeed. There's this this very Belgian thing, like anyone who who becomes bigger than Belgium is immediately hated. So they're very they're they're sounds familiar. Yes, <laughs> well maybe it's not a Belgian thing. Um, so I knew that uh, by by he just started following me on Instagram one day. I think he's just very into movies. But I have like a few thousand followers. He like six million people follow this guy. So it was it was weird. <laughs> Uh, but we started talking, and he's a nerd like we all are, I think. He likes Jean-Claude Van Damme, and he likes uh, uh, the Saw movies, he likes The Fast and the Furious, so we got talking. Um, and I thought it's it's interesting because he's a brand unto himself, him and his brother. So maybe his audience will come, whatever crazy or weird movie I, I think of, maybe they'll show up. Um, which is kind of unique, we don't have superstar actors in Belgium uh, necessarily, except for Jean-Claude Van Damme, of course. Um, so that was how I, I, I um, basically found Dimitri. And then because of COVID, I had a, usually he's on tour with his brother, but he was stuck at home like we all were. So every weekend I went to his man cave uh, and we just talked about the script. And my trick was to, um, because he was an untrained actor, we, we read the script together. And then after every scene, I asked him, does this remind you of a, a moment in your life? Like who, who would this character be in your life? And not only did we get deeper into the script, but we we started to trust each other, and I think that's a, a method I will use more with actors. So you build the character together, in a sense. Yeah, I don't think uh, what, the American script was nothing like this at all. It was it wasn't a comedy, and now I hope. Uh, well, I I noticed it was a comedy because people were laughing. So perhaps there's a question from the audience at this point. Ah, yeah. Did he also suggest some of the music? Because music is a really big part of the movie. So maybe you can tell us a bit about how you chose it and why and so on. Sandstorm. Yes. Yeah, Dimitri was basically our music supervisor. So um, there's a lot of music in there that um, we couldn't afford. But then because he's a famous DJ, sometimes he would just be on his phone and like five minutes later, the route had said yes because the route was high somewhere in a club and <laughs> thought it was a good idea. Um, but it was also a cause of conflict because the very first track uh, you hear when, when he's cleaning his car, he sent me a track list ages ago and one of the songs on there, it's called Virtual Zone and it's a, an unknown Belgian track and I fell in love with it. Um, and he was like, no, you can't do this. This is like uh, music for a carnival in Belgium. Uh, no one will look me in the eye in the DJ world, but he couldn't and that was pretty cool. He couldn't find a better track. So he tried like a hundred things. And then we, we decided, okay, we need to get Virtual Zone. And I think they asked more money than The Root in the end. So, uh, yeah. yeah. But he was a great help with the music because it's not my scene at all. But I, I've come to love this kind of, what is it, Euro trance, I guess? Uh, Euro dance. Uh, and especially when we had the infamous, uh, well, infamous to me, the car sex scene. Uh, it became, I already liked it in the edit, but it became really my favorite scene when he found that music, the uh, 9 p.m. till I come, which is, yeah, not very subtle. Uh, but that 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 song really uh, took it to a next level, I think. Yeah. So I'm very grateful to him as a music supervisor as well. Another question? Oh, yeah, she has another one. <laughs> so uh, about the cars and uh, like the fetishism of the car, could you say a bit about that? Was that already in the script, or you know, did you also do some research? Uh, and so on. So, um, it wasn't in the script. I think the the first thing I I said to add to the script was the opening scene where you really see him loving his car and washing it. I thought if if yeah if we're gonna stay in this car, let's try and love this car as well. 
uh, the the sex scene, which is probably what you're talking about, wasn't in the script either. It was a scene. It was a sex scene. It had nothing to do with the car. It wasn't homophobic, but I think taken out of context, it could have been seen that way. So I didn't want to die on that hill. That wasn't mine. So we tried to change it into something else, which really became way more perverse than the scene that was actually there. And then I remembered um, there was a trailer for uh, John Carpenter movie Christine. Um, and I just remembered it was a teaser and it just showed parts of the car and a very sensual voiceover. And you think you're looking at a woman's body and then you find out it's a car. So that made me realize Cars are sexual objects anyway. They're curved because of, you know, uh, people need to buy them basically. So I thought let's let's um, let's try and milk it for milk it is a strange word in this context. Uh, let's try to get get especially uh, yes considering your scene. Yes, exactly. So there is a connection, and I try let's have as much fun with it as possible. Yeah, for sure. Another question. Perhaps you can also say a bit about, you know, it's it's a action film, you know, in a car, all that, but it also has a sense of, you know, a, a, a slight horror moment inside. Yeah. And your previous film is more in that genre. And I, as I read somewhere, your next projects as well. So I'm wondering about this a bit, you know, of putting different genres into this, you know, car chase. Film. Yeah, I think that was part of the appeal that the fact that this was basically be gonna gonna be little vignettes of, of of car scenes, and I thought, oh, we can race through different genres. Like, there's a bit of animation in there, which is another love of mine, but also the the scene with the eight o'clock dog, which is a story my grandmother used to tell me. Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, the movie I looked at is a car movie. It's also a, a dog movie. It's Cujo, and uh, it's such a brilliant movie. Also, I think you're stuck in that car for, for about an hour of the movie. So um, that was, yeah, 100% uh, the inspiration for the, the dog attack, wolf attack scene. Yes. Uh, horror is my, my first love. This didn't happen to be a horror uh, film. Hopefully, I can do some more in the future. But I did think, like, let's, let's put at least a, a nod to horror in there. Yeah. And the animation, it's really nice because, you know, before they talk about Space Jam and, you know, seeing, and, and then. The, the animation kind of reminds you of that, so it's a really nice scene. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> um, and a, a question? Oh, yeah. There. Thank you. Hi. Um, so, how much is the main character based on the Ali G in the house movie? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like the, the car and the, the tracksuit and the haircut. Don't you? I mean, like it. it, it uh, consciously zero percent, but now you mention him subconsciously, probably more like eighty-five percent. Yes. Okay. Cool. Cool. Even the color scheme is the same. You right. <laughs> yes. Yellow. <laughs> Thank you. Oh yeah. Sure. Another one. Another two. It's not really a question. I would just like to give some appreciation to a very authentic Russian bouncer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that was a, a throwback to my home country. That's <laughs> okay. Okay. So the bouncers. Yeah, we we have a. Um, well, that on, was part on Vushibalo, of. On Vushibalo, on Vushibayet. <laughs> it was great. Thank you. That's a, a stand-up comedian, a friend of mine called uh, Sergei Lupuchansky, and my idea was like it's it's a it's a homage to my hometown of Antwerp, and whenever a movie about Antwerp comes out, they're all speaking Flemish uh, very neatly. But when I walk around in Antwerp and listen to, oh sorry, listen to um, the people on the street, I hear eight to ten different languages, and it's kind of part of that. Like there's, I think, seven or eight languages spoken in the movie, and I'm, I'm very proud of that because that's what the real Antwerp experience is like. There was another question. There. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for this really entertaining film. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and um, I wanted to ask, um, or wanted to to ask about two aspects of the film. Because I think it's also very cute. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I wanted to ask if that was in the original script or if this is coming from you, like this really sweet uh, relationship between him and not only yeah, his family, actually, because it's his girlfriend and his daughter. And um, I think the, the whole um, the note the film is ending is very happy ending. Uh, 
ish. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not only that you stop on they both survive and the daughter is not even traumatized, <laughs> at least as far as we can see. And um, she will be the day after. Yeah, yes. I think so too. But at least she was Ariel, um, very, very contemporary actually. But um, also he gets all the money. So we oh, you don't know actually because it cuts right before you know whether the other guy's standing up or not. So you don't know. Yeah. Okay. But you're giving a huge hint, at least for me. There's a chance that you'll yeah. get all so, the money. Yeah. So how far did you want it to go with this happy ending, actually? Uh, yeah, it was in the script, the, the, the daughter and the, and the mother. Um, but I, how do I say this? Like, I did, I did, um, would, I don't have children myself, but my, my younger brother and my younger sister have children, and I see how much um, love they get from that. And I realized that as a filmmaker, you kind of want to prolong your um, puberty for as long as possible. So the movie is one big <laughs> ode to my uh, pubescent years, maybe. But then at the end, I realized like I need to be the guy that gets out of his car and actually chooses a real life. <laughs> so it, it's really personal to me in that way. Like um, I think his struggle is real. Like you can you can be all about your gadgets and kind of um, not take care of your family properly. Or one day something happens that you need to decide and really go for it. So I, I'm, I'm happy that's, that that came true, because it's really just a plot device in the movie. Because but the kid is so cute, I think that that really helps. Uh, and no, it was important to me, like the fact that there's this strange sex scene, and the way he convinces his nephew to go ahead with it is say to his face, "Yeah, but I need to pick up my little girl at 3:30." Uh, yeah, the sweetness was definitely uh, part of the appeal. I didn't want to make a macho movie. We make enough of macho movies in Belgium, and I, I wanted this to be the opposite of that. Yes, for sure. Another question? If not, perhaps I can have the last question. Uh, the lyrics of the Don Carlito song. <laughs> <laughs> Who wrote that? So th that guy is a, is a Jeroen Perceval. He's, he's not just an actor, he's also a director. He made an incredible movie a few years ago called Dealer. He's also, um, Dealer, yeah. <laughs> he's also uh, a rapper uh, in Dutch. And the first collaboration we did was, I think five years ago, I shot a music video of his. Um, and that's, that was our first real collaboration. So I knew we could do it. Uh, it wasn't in the script, the guy wasn't a rapper, but I think I convinced Jeroen, it was kind of a trade-off. I said, can you be in it? And he's like, yeah, but I need a, a birthmark. And I said, okay, but you need to rap. He said, okay, I'll rap, but I need to have a lisp. And then I said, okay, you can have a lisp, but you don't wear shoes, you wear flip-flops. He was like, okay. <laughs> and that's how we create characters in Belgium. <laughs> yes. Nice, thank you. Thank you so much once thank again. Thank you, and thank you all for staying okay. and watching.